Greetings, my name is Louise Dente and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition, we explore African American and Asian relations, history and culture with Professor Peter Kwong. He is a distinguished professor of urban affairs and planning at Hunter College, as well as professor of sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is a pioneer in Asian American studies, a leading scholar on immigration, as well as an award-winning journalist and filmmaker who's widely recognized for his passionate commitment to human rights and social justice. He is a scholar who's best known for his work on Chinese Americans and modern Chinese politics. And one of his books includes Chinese America, the untold story of America's oldest new community and Chinese Americans, an immigrant experience. Well, we look forward to speaking to him. Let's welcome uh, Professor Kwong, as well as our um, own distinguished professor, Dr. William Sorrell, Professor Emeritus of African and African American Studies at Lehman College. Well, I know in our last conversation you explored a lot of the commonalities, the history, the struggles. And in this uh, particular episode, we really want to look at uh, busting the myths, the myth versus reality. And, and let's just first talk about some of the common perceptions of Asian Americans do you find that most Americans have? Please share with us. Well, I think one of the uh, most common perception is the Chinese as a group mm -hmm. is all together. Mm -hmm. And they love together, they, you know, they hang out together, and there's all this feeling that somehow they don't want to be part of the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is the history from the very beginning. One mm -hmm. of the one of the justification for exclusion act was Chinese don't want to be part of America. Mm -hmm. which is not the case, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that perception partly has to sh uh, uh, is the result of segregation. Um, you can't get a job in the American labor market, uh, you can't live in, in uh, general uh, neighborhoods, and so therefore, you know, they depend on each other. And they may not like each other. In fact, uh, there, are, there are always uh, class conflict within the Chinese American people. That's mm -hmm. something that nobody knows, mm -hmm. all right? Because uh, because you, you see, in in all the Chinese uh, uh, communities, particularly in Chinatown in these areas, you have two different kind of uh, mm -hmm. classes. One is working people. Uh, 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 not speaking very well good English and uh, uh, not have remarkable skills, they, they work. And oftentimes they work for a Chinese employer. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they co-dependent each other mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, uh, immigrants uh, make money for the employer mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, uh, particularly within that kind of environment, uh, they've been super exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, but people don't see that part. Mm -hmm. People think, wow, they're all together. Mm -hmm. and, and so when they, there's a strike, or when, oftentimes they're no, ignored, mm -hmm. uh, even, even today. Mm. Now, uh, Professor Sorrell, tell us about some, what are some of the common misconceptions about African Americans that you can see that American society? Well, we have a number of stereotypes, and you can find these in literature and certainly later on in uh, Hollywood movies and television. You had the uh, happy-go-lucky, which meant always grinning. In fact, I was told that one time. I was in college. The professor said to me, uh, your, your people are always smiling. Why aren't you smiling today? <laughs> uh, the brute, we call the brute Negro, right. who, who was over uh, very high in physique. And I think we get that today in some of these police shootings when cops said, well, he was a monster or a beast. Mm -hmm. and, and you get the exotic primitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, primarily that dealt with, uh, like for example, New York papers would have in the 20s uh, illustrations about the Cotton Club and they show girls dr dressed like they were in Hawaii in hula skirts. Mm -hmm. And then they have bales of cotton where, mm -hmm. you know, to emphasize that point. And then you get the happy-go-lucky and, and you get the, uh, what was the tragedy mulatto? Mm -hmm. Where the person who was, um, you know, uh, results of um, interracial sex would be lost to both white and black societies, and 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 you, and you get the um, you know the rapists, 
mm -hmm. which is part of the brute as well. Mm -hmm. And these are all perpetuated in, in television and movies. So the movie Birth mm -hmm. of a Nation, you, you get lawmakers who are African Americans during Reconstruction who mm -hmm. are ignorant mm -hmm. and who are lusting after white women. And that just gets, even King Kong, you know, in the movie King, King Kong represents black men. Mm. Now, in line with that, you talk about the media, and we talk about how the media, as Dr. Sorrell has talked mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. has created these stereotypical right. images of African Americans that have traveled all over the world. And there are people, I'm sure, in Asia and China and all over who these perceptions are mm -hmm. still there. Yes. What are some of the perceptions the media have kind of created around Chinese Americans and Asian Americans? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, in the old days, um, that that uh, the Chinese um, are seen as cunning uh, and um, uh, smart in small ways, mm -hmm. all right, um, and also not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 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 later on, it's the 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 the, the whole image that Chinese are going to take over the United States, the yellow peril. Mm -hmm. And so you have this Fu Manchu thing somehow. Uh, even, even, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even the James Bond movie had this, mm -hmm. this idea that somehow some Chinese wicked person is going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. And so there is that impenetrable, somehow these people are so outside of rationality. Uh, um, so that's, that's one of those uh, images. Mm -hmm. um, and in cartoons, you have so many. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't grow up in, mm -hmm. in the United States in, in, in yes. that kind of stuff, but, not, uh, but mm -hmm. certainly that's... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, about Charlie Chan. I mean, yes. Charlie was Chan. A white person, but, yeah. but was Charlie Chan supposed to be like extra savvy in solving crime? Yes, and sub submissive. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so Charlie, Charlie Chan is the good Chinese versus the... Uh, the, uh, the Hop Singh and Bonanza. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... So, um, uh, so, so there's also also this sense. I mean, this is a sense of violence, mm -hmm. right? Town wars and uh, martial art and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is uh, which is really uh, exaggerated. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I saw, mm -hmm. I saw a stereotype in a TV series on HBO <clears throat> about this city called Deadwood. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a western exactly. city. Mm -hmm. And the only Chinese in the film were, I guess there were chefs, mm -hmm. but every time they kill, a, every time a person get killed, they just throw them into this, give them to the Chinese to throw into the pit to feed the, the pigs. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, so, as if they're uncaring, mm -hmm. no, no, no sense yeah. of, of feelings. So, it's, it's, it's interesting because I actually went to Deadwood mm -hmm. uh, because um, I was writing this book. I tra my wife and I traveled mm -hmm. to all the little towns the Chinese mm -hmm. used to be. Chinese was all over the West Coast, mm -hmm. all the way from uh, uh, from California, Oregon, Washington, mm -hmm. all the way to South uh, Dakota, Utah, mm -hmm. and all these places. Mm -hmm. We we end up in uh, 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 Deadwood, mm -hmm. and uh, um, the um, the curator, the museum mm -hmm. curator, uh, saw me. He's ah, so excited. You mm -hmm. know, we found we found this. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, excavation found this uh, Chinese uh, opium mm -hmm. there. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, anything has to do mm -hmm. with Chinese opium. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, uh, it's the idea that uh, Chinese smoke opium. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese have their underground tunnels. God knows what they, all right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's all these very weird, mystical, mm -hmm. uh, strange ideas about what the Chinese do, which mm -hmm. normal people sh wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do and wouldn't do. Now, as an African American, some of the earliest connections that African Americans yes. have to kind of Chinese culture is the food. Yes. You know, in every African American community, there's a Chinese restaurant and people become familiar. That's right. Just as a question, is the food that we receive in these food, is this actually what Chinese eat themselves or what? Okay, so <laughs> let's be very, very clear, all right? Uh, Chinese getting involved in cooking, opening restaurant, 99% of the time has nothing to do with the fact they know how to cook. Mm, right? Interesting. Because 
uh, in the old days, Chinese couldn't get regular jobs because mm -hmm. whites don't want to work with Chinese. So they have to be self-employed. Mm -hmm. so, well, there's only two really easy industry to get in. It's providing food uh, and uh, 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 laundries. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. before the 1960s, everybody know Chinese either laundry men or restaurant. Right? So mm -hmm. restaurant, so, so it is a way to survive. Mm -hmm. If you want to survive, you better serve food other people want to eat. Mm -hmm. And so you have to adapt to what they want to eat. Mm -hmm. In addition to the fact you may not know how to cook to begin with. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the quality of food uh, uh, in, in, in the United States, uh, first of all, it's, it was not very good to begin with. Mm -hmm. And when you have adapting to American taste, then it's all bunch of mumbo jumbo stuff. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, and, and I think, it, it, interesting enough, uh, the Chinese uh, chef adapting to uh, different neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? Um, the whites who have certain kind of favorites, the blacks with certain kind of favorites. Spare ribs. Mm -hmm. Spare ribs, <laughs> and you yes. know, uh, 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 chow mein, the chow fun. A anyway, mm -hmm. so, uh, it, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, only Chinese, but my point is that these are adaptations, mm -hmm. and uh, um, certainly they are not the kind of food that the Chinese would eat oh. uh, normally. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, uh, cuisine in China also uh, moving around, changing. Oh. So, so in in the larger sense, that you know Chinese food, there is really you can't say authentic because it will base on, you know. Another uh, perception is that Chinese people know Kung Fu. You know, going up in the 70s, a lot of people watched the Bruce Lee movies and saw, you know, Asian people really seriously kicking some butt, as they say. And so tell me about that perception. Do all Asians know Kung Fu? By asking that question, you reveal your age, <laughs> because that's really the 70s. Yes. Um, previous to that, Chinese are seen as weakling. Not only weakling, they are kind of feminine, right? You have all these images, either they asexual or feminine, because they so 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 short physically and all that. Um, Bruce Lee, uh, it, it was a phenomenon at the time. You know, the the civil rights. Uh, the feeling good about yourself, and it just fit in that period of time. Um, I never, I mean, it was a surprise to me. I mean, I was working in Harlem uh, doing some construction for, for poor housing, and everybody's looking at me, calling me Bruce Lee. <laughs> and so that's a changing, changing to away from an earlier, much more negative attitude about the Chinese. Uh, uh, to answer your question, no, most people don't know how to do that. Uh, I, think the, I, I think the Americans are more interested in Kung Fu than, you know, I mean, a lot of parents don't want their kids to, to, to be doing this. Mm -hmm. right. And so it's interesting because um, in addition, in a more modern time, the yeah. Kung Fu Kid, where you had this uh, American youth going karate to, kid. you know, Karate Kid, thank you, uh, going to China and uh, you know, being bullied and somehow learning, you know. And, and let's get to this whole notion of the mental superiority, you know. And I, and I think about um, the earlier perceptions of Confucius, you know, of the being a wise person, the, and then also the perception of Chinese being very superior, you know, mentally, you know, being academically. super smart academically. Tell us about that and the challenges. Well, actually, uh, again, shows your age. <laughs> because, because in the 1960s, uh, you have more or less one group of Chinese in the United States, mm -hmm. which are working class. Mm -hmm. There are a lot, of, a lot of Chinese came here to go to college. They're the elite of the elite from China. Mm -hmm. They graduate from college, which very, very, very few people did. You come to the United States to graduate from graduate school, I mean, that's really very, very rare. So most of them went back to China, all right? So the only people who were here were working class, not educated, laundrymen, that kind of people, right? It is only after 1949 when 
uh, communist regime came, mm -hmm. a lot of professionals began either stranded here uh, or come from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So this is the beginning of different Chinese. Mm -hmm. There's the Chinese of working class, there's the Chinese who are super, super educated, mm -hmm. right? Even in the American, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, that's what I use the term, the downtown Chinese mm -hmm. and uptown Chinese. Mm -hmm. And the uptown Chinese is the phenomenon you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Uptown Chinese, um, uh, those who, immigrants, uh, graduate from college in China, the cream of the crop of Taiwan uh, or, or, or Hong Kong, and come to the United States to go to graduate school, they go straight into upper middle class neighborhood, right? Because they, then they are doctors, they, they, they are professors, uh, phys, uh, uh, physicists, et cetera, et cetera. And they have nothing to do with Chinatown, right? They don't even speak the same dialect, uh, uh, people in Chinatown. In those days, Cantonese. So, so that group of people, their offsprings right, are the ones we talk about super achiever because they study their ass off when they were young. So when they have their own kids, they make sure they impose the same kind of harsh, rigorous schedules on their own kids and, and really push them, support them, whether they like it or not, the chances of these group, this group of people achieving the, the percentages. So, so you, you, you see these very, very highly achieved Chinese Americans, right? But then you don't see the, the Chinese American who are coming from working class neighborhoods. So this is where, you know, uh, this, this gap we don't, we don't notice. A, a student of mine did, did a, 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 a research of hunter kids, Chinese kids, versus Columbia kids, mm -hmm. they are totally different. Uh, and the outcome, uh, the, the, the preparation, everything is different. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, previously there's only one mode. Mm -hmm. They're working class, they are you know, laundry and whatever. Uh, after 1960s, uh, um, uh, 70s, you have two separate, and we, we, we confuse them. Exactly. But they are not really, uh, 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 for a long time, there's very little interaction. Mm -hmm. Now, just bringing it up to the present, um, right now, and I'm just referring to two popular sitcoms, and it always seems to be comedy. For example, there's a new sitcom called Fresh Off the Boat, which has an Asian family, and this is supposed to be, I don't know if you've watched it or know the perceptions. I just would like your perception of that show in conjunction with Blackish, which is another show. I don't know how much television you watch. Uh, you know, and these are shows that are supposedly portraying the modern African American and Asian American family. You got another one. It's, uh, I think it's a Korean family and a, a bartender. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they had. Yeah, they have the Korean earlier. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So just in, in just bringing to the present day, and, and my concern is comedy that you, you, you're not really seeing, we're not really seeing um, drama, but we're seeing a lot of comedy, whether it be Asian American families, African American families. Bill, talk to us, and particularly you did have seen the show that have been out. Well, I, I've seen, I don't watch the show on a regular basis, but I've seen a few episodes, and uh, I think you used to try to address some of the issues mm -hmm. uh, that affect the community at large which is a lot better than some of the earlier comedies. Mm -hmm. Some of the earlier comedies are just straight out stereotypes, mm -hmm. uh, even buffoonery, mm -hmm. which goes back to the stereotype of you know, happy-go-lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Blackish, it, it dealt with identity, uh, yeah, again, in, in, in comedy, but like, who are you? you know, who are we? Mm -hmm. And it shows, too, some of the differences because the mother and the father come from different cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So that's, inter that's put into play uh, you know, in the dialogue mm -hmm. with the children. Mm -hmm. So I think in that case it's, it's helpful because if you have a situation where uh, the father thinks the N-word is, oh, it's okay, it among us, the mother says, no, you can't do that. So that shows a you know, cultural difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Or like, the, like the, the, uh, the, the patriarch of the family uh, Lawrence mm -hmm. Fishburne, mm -hmm. like he's hard on his grandson, like be a man, be a man, and the, you know the, his son is trying to say, well, Dad, you know this is a different time period. Mm -hmm. You know, like the boy has a little sensitivity here. Mm -hmm.
Tell me about. Well, I, I think it, it, compared to the African Americans, there is a long, much longer history of shows has uh, African American characters. Some of the shows uh, basically African descent uh, was sent. Sanford 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 there are hardly any. Uh, Margaret Cho did one series about 10 years ago, and it really failed. Uh, and now you, you, you have several of these things. So, so you, you're basically a show trying to bring out all these complicated... Uh, like joy, like love. <laughs> all these different yeah. things yeah. that... Um, uh, it's never going to satisfy anybody. I mean, it's humor, it's edgy, and some of the things are real. Some I cringe every time I, you know, because I feel so well. This is so so much generalization. So it's not a good thing to ask me because some some of the younger people feel, oh, this is the first time we have a we have a presence, uh, and uh, they feel positive. I just feel that. Uh, uh, well, that's why it's very, very American because. Um, now, I was, I was a teenager in the 50s, yeah. and my mother would call me, come, come, come quick, and I'd yeah. run down the stairs, yeah. and, oh, you just missed it, and what I just missed was like <laughs> one person, you know, like Nat King Cole, yeah. and Variety yeah. Hour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe next year someone else yeah. will be on TV, and then yeah. finally they start getting gradually the yeah. situation comedies, yeah. and again, a lot of it just you know, yeah. buffoonery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I just think that the, the, uh, uh, the, the exposure of Asian in the media, mm -hmm. uh, in the entertainment, is so limited, and yet uh, a public understanding of them is so minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the frustration. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't, you're not familiar with people mm -hmm. say, "Well, you know, we don't want to." You know, you, it's it's not going to be a successful show. Mm -hmm. So it, it's this kind of right now. There seem to be a recognition mm -hmm. that the Asian population is growing so fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the old days, when you know I was starting Asian American Studies program, and uh, nobody gives a damn, you know, it's the affirmative action thing. Now they would say, "Hey, you know, uh, thirty percent of our campus is Asian. We got to do something about it." So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a beginning, a positive way. I'm, I should not expect too much out of these shows. Uh, we need more and need to to dig into deeper. Now, in line, and, and, and particularly, I don't know if this question will border into another <laughs> episode, but I want to deal with the whole perception that we have, the groups have amongst each other. And, and somehow, like we said, we expose some of the stereotypes. Yeah. And, and I think that's yeah. important because some of these stereotypes keep yes. both groups away. Yeah. Fear, right. insecurities, yeah. misconceptions. Yeah. What can we do, and I'm saying from historical, as historians, what do you think needs to happen to bring both groups closer together, understanding one another, okay, and, and so forth? What would you suggest? I'm well, I would suggest you can <coughs> uh, have knowledge of history, because you had the Chinese uh, law, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Exclusion Act, 1882, to say Chinese should not be in America. Uh, we had people in that time period and shortly thereafter having exclusion laws against African Americans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like constitutional changes in the Deep South where they yeah. dealt with voting or what we call public accommodations. And we had people even back after the Civil War were trying to say, maybe we should go back to Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't work because the realization as it is today with Latinos is who's going to do the work. <laughs> right. And you can't kick out people and not to replace them with workers. Mm -hmm. So, so the, actually, you brought out a very interesting point that whereas I mentioned earlier that African-American Chinese, there are frictions. The contact is not great. There were contentions. But when the Congress is trying to pass 1882 Exclusion Act, most African American leaders were against it. It's one thing to be, uh, to be uh, hostile or, or, or feeling uh, threatened by the Chinese competition, mm -hmm. but in, it's another thing to exclude them uh, as a group, uh, because may, some of the uh, 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 some of the top uh, African American leaders says that would be a bad precedent. If you could do this, it could happen to African Americans too. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is something that uh, there's so many different nuances that we 
do not have the opportunity to interchange uh, that will enrich our understanding of America much, much more so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of it is keeping these conversations going and boarding and bridging the conversations to kind of bring us understanding of the commonalities, yeah. our uniqueness, right. and how we as a nation can come to a, a better understanding in this most diverse city in the world. Right. Well, with that said, I just want to thank you both for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and certainly this conversation, and there's so many aspects that we'd like to continue. But again, um, I just just want to say thank you both for joining thank us you. and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this broadcast and we continue to encourage you to tune in, to write, and to tell a friend. But until next time, Louise Dente saying thank you. I realized that to learn about the people, you study the dance. And when you study the dance, you learn the history of the people. Because dance in traditional African cultures used to preserve. And so that the young coming forth learn by age group. And as I said, you know, I'm skipping, skipping, skipping. Years, years, years. In, in traditional African cultures, you learn by age group.